Amen. Next song will be page number 34. Page number 34, we'll sing one, two, and four. Page 34. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for, for you. Listen to his voice. Leave him with your care. And begin life anew. Kneel at the cross. At the cross. Kneel at the cross. Leave every Because 
once again to the spirit filled life this is what Paul has been going through with uh, the church in Ephesus and I would remind us that the spirit of God he wants to control every area of the lives that we live Paul's already touched on our walk with God our worship life uh, our marriages and the parent child relationship and in these verses he focuses our thoughts on the master slave relationship uh, if we look at Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 9 and it says servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as, as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service, as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. So, you know, we, we look and... In this day and time, not ours, but in this day and time in the book of Ephesians, it's estimated that in that time period there were as many as 50 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Slavery was a common institution, and interesting enough, slavery is never condemned in the Bible. While the Bible does not condemn slavery, it was, a, it was a system that was rife with abuse. I mean, you know, they treated them like nothing. So we look 
there were uh, a lot of different things that we could say and, and, and things about slaves and, and their owners and, and this, that, and the other. But we have to get to the point of this and the system of slavery was so filled with abuse that God instructed Paul to lay down the Lord's commands to both the slaves and their masters. So we're going to look at these instructions today or begin them today and we do not have slaves in our culture. Thankfully, that institution has been outlawed in our, our nation. And the closest we can come to the master-slave relationship is a relationship between employers and their employees. The same principles apply. So we're not, we're not bringing anything that's... Uh, anything that's not written I mean the, the exact same principle the principles that Paul gave to masters and slaves years ago they still apply to us today and there is a word here for each of us I think if we will receive it so as we look and, and we look at these verses and we consider the spirit filled service the principles in these verses have something to say to us about the way we serve the Lord and the way we serve others. So it's not only the slave and master, the employer and the employees, but it is the believer and the Lord. So first of all, uh, we begin with the word to the employees. Look at verses 5 through 7. It says, uh, Service be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Okay, now, Paul addresses the servants in these verses. The word always means slaves. And he is talking to people who were owned by some master. They were bought and sold, beaten and put to death, all at the whim of their master. Thankfully, no one here is a slave to any man. And however, uh, many are still working in the workforce in the workforce today, and we have employers. These verses tell us how we are supposed to relate to those who are over us in our secular work. Verse five tells us how they are to submit. They are commanded to be obedient. The word refers to one who waits for a command from the master and who then carries out that command. In the, in the military, it it's, could be the same thing. To obedient would be uh, a higher ranking person gives a lower ranking individual an order and he does it. We saw in... Uh, Back in, uh, I think it was the, uh, back in Luke, when we were dealing with the woman with the issue of blood, and Jesus was on his way to the centurion's home, and Anyway, there, there are two of these stories that are just about alike, so one or the other. Anyway, and he makes a comment. So Centurion makes a comment, or, the, or this 
person makes a comment and he says, you know, here I am, I am over this many men, I tell this person to do this or that and he does this or that. I tell him to come or to go and he comes and or he goes. He does what I tell him to. Well, you know, in in this, this uh, as servants, we are to be doing the same thing. Uh, as we are to be obedient, uh, when we are, are commanded, are instructed to do something, then we do it. You know, these words, uh, this uh, obedient, it is used of like a porter who waited at the door for the sound of a knock so that the door could be opened immediately. That was his job. It's, it is a word and it speaks of willing, expectant service. This kind of service jumps at the sound of a master's voice. And it does what he is told without argument or complaint. The kind of obedience we find here is carried out in verse 5 it says with fear and trembling. Now it doesn't mean that the employee should fear his employer to the very fact that he goes into work and clocks in on the clock and, and just begins to tremble because he's afraid. We're not, we're not speaking that. The idea is of fear and trembling does not mean that they fear the people they work for. It means that the godly servant strives to do what is right out of a fear of disobeying God. You may be, you may be following the instructions of your employer, but you're working as if you're working unto God. You know, the work, all the work that we do in the world as an employee is actually service to the Lord. Because we are instructed how we are to work. So when we're working for an employer, we are working as if we're working unto the Lord. We are to submit to those who are in authority over us in the world and serve them with singleness of heart as unto Christ. So we are to, to obey them and do as they instruct us as if we are doing it unto Christ. The phrase there... Uh, refers to literally wholehearted dedication. We are to yield ourselves to our employers, serving them as if they were the Lord. Because after all, when we work and we do the things in the manner in which we're to do them, it's just as if we are working unto the Lord. He's the one that's paying attention just as well as the employer. And it isn't always easy. Believe me. There are people who are hard to work for. Mean-spirited, demanding, demeaning, and cruel. I knew a person when I was at the post service and she was the hardest person to work for. Because she did not she didn't care what you had to say whether if you thought it was right, wrong or the other one, she didn't care you did what she said and I got along with her and later on we became friends and things but she was still the same person she was As best as you can, we are to look past the person and perhaps their issues 
and set your eyes on the Lord and serve Him. Even as you do your work on earth. You know, when, when, when we work here, we're working as if we're working for the Lord. We ought to have that frame of mind and that frame of our heart. No matter how hard they are to get along with, we got to remember that the Lord's watching and we, we got to work as if we're working for Him. Secondly, we, these employees, they need to know how they are to serve. There, as we read verses 5 through 7, according to these verses, a person's secular employment is just another means of serving the Lord. In verse 5, he says, as unto Christ. In verse 6, Paul says, as the servants of Christ. And also in verse 6, that we are to do the will of God from the heart. We can look in verse 7 and Paul says doing service as unto the Lord. And literally all these things, these descriptions of how we're supposed to do it, it literally means that if the Lord has given you a job and if you carry out the duties of that job to the glory of the Lord, God will bless the secular work the same as He blesses the sacred work. He'll bless the plumber just like He blesses the preacher. He'll bless the miner and the missionary. He'll bless the truck driver and the deacon. He will bless all those who will serve Him and honor Him in the work they do. The way that we work for someone, if we're doing it as if unto the Lord, it brings honor to Him. If we do it grudgingly, you know, we're, we're just... Rah, 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 and we don't do the job that we ought to be doing, then the one we're hurting is the Lord. The key to the Lord's blessings is to see your work as service to the Lord and not to a person or a business. Work as if you were working for the Lord. See, when, when, when Paul was going through these things, we, we, we got to understand that everything we've seen so far as we've seen in the book of Ephesians is a change of person that Paul's trying to bring out. And you know, they have been doing the same old things for so long and it's culture, it's the way they were brought up and the way perhaps somebody else was brought up and brought up and brought up and it's just been passed down. All these values and all these things and now Paul is saying, hey, you, you are a born again believer. You need to have a different mindset of what you're doing. And in these verses, I mean, you know, he's literally telling them that you need to work whatever job you're doing as if you're working for the Lord. Not because you're working for old grubble pants over here or whatever. He also says there in verse 6 that we are not to serve or to work with eye service. The phrase refers to serving to impress. It has the idea of working hard when they are looking and slacking off when they're not looking. The Lord's will is that we give them we give our employers a full day's work for a full day's pay. Even when the boss isn't looking, 
the servant or the or the employee, the worker, needs to realize that the Lord is looking. He also says there in verse 6 that we are not to be men pleasers. Now this word speaks of those who are smooth talking, slick, uh, swarming, suck up. You know, it speaks of those who use flattery to advance on the job. Both of those actions are manifestations of the flesh. Eye service and men pleasers are nothing more than manifestations of the flesh. They speak of someone who is walking in pride and who is actually serving themselves and not the Lord. Instead of seeking to promote ourselves, we should be in the business of serving the Lord. Whatever type of job we do, it's all going to come out in the end. If not this side, that side. It's just like the treasures we lay up. We could be the poorest person on the face of the earth and yet be the richest person in heaven because of the treasures that we have laid up there. Same difference. We can look again at these phrases as unto Christ, as the servants of Christ, doing the will of the Lord from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Now, in these phrases, all of these statements, they teach us that we are to see ourselves as slaves to the Lord first and foremost. If we're working in a dairy farm and our job is to clean up cow you know what and milk cows for a living then we ought to though we ought to be cleaning up you know what to the very best that we can and milk cows we ought to be the champion cow milker of whatever that's the idea that is that Paul's trying to get them to realize here. You know, but this goes completely against because in this they're talking about masters and slaves. You know. So it goes, these ideas go completely against what they've been brought up with. So now they have to literally learn and turn and acquire a new mindset about what they're doing. Both sides. Whether you're the slave or the employee or you're the master or the employer. There are both sides of this that learn, need to learn, that have to learn something in order to turn these things around where they're profitable unto the Lord. When we go to our job, whatever it is, we are to look at our work as service to God. We are to see ourselves as His slaves. We are to remember that we will answer to Him when this life ends. If we work for Him, we will please Him. And if our service rises to the level of pleasing Him, surely our employers will be pleased with our service as well. After all, we have to look at our lives and look at the standards in which we're trying to live our lives. It's not worldly standards. It's godly standards. 
So if, if we could do our work and we please Him, our employer is going to be pleased. Or our master or whatever the case is. There are several ways that we can serve the Lord in this world. And it applies to what we do on the job, to what we do in life, and to what we do in the church. A few of the ways that we might serve Him. Okay? We can serve Him at a discipline. Now, this is an attitude that says, I have to do it. It describes someone who feels compelled to serve the Lord. You know, they just can't help themselves. I, I, I got to serve the Lord. Second, we can serve Him out of duty. This attitude says, I ought to do it. It describes someone who is convinced that he owes it to the Lord. I just ought to do it for what He did for me. What little bit that He's asking me to do, I'll, I just ought to do it. We can serve Him out of devotion. This is the attitude that says, I want to do it. It describes a person who is captured by the Lord. They serve Him because they love Him. And this is the way that our service ought to be. We serve Him because we love Him. John chapter 14. And in verse 15, it says, If ye love me, now this is Jesus speaking, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If ye love me, keep my commandments. So if you say you love me, then keep my commandments. You show me that you love me because you keep my commandments. You know, if we look at these, a few of these ways that we might serve Him, the attitudes, if we look at them as we went through these three, it, said, it goes from I have to do it to I ought to do it to I want to do it. Yeah. Now, we could do these things. We may start off over here with I have to do it. Then we come and we progress and our walk with the Lord, and we get to the point of where I ought to do it. And then as we progress in the Lord, and we mature and, and, and we get closer and closer, then we come to the point where uh, it's I want to do it. We go from all the way from I got to do I ought to? Do I want to? We should want to serve the Lord just like Joseph served Potiphar in Genesis 39. Pages so thin in this Bible. In 
chapter 39 and in verse number 4 it says, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. It's the same uh, difference as Joseph served Potiphar as he did the warden in Pharaoh's prison. Look at uh, verse 23. It says, The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So, we look at the attitude in which Joseph served and God blessed it, multiplied it, turned it to good. The same thing He can do for us. We should want to serve Him like the servant girl served Nahum in 2 Kings and in verses uh, chapter 5 and verses 1 through 4 that says now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable uh, because by him the Lord had given deliverance into Syria he also was a mighty man in valor but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. So we get into this, you know, she just cared to serve for him. <coughs> whether we are serving the Lord directly, or whether we serve Him through our service to our employer, we must always do the will of God from the heart. Strive to serve Him in all things. So what about the employers? What 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 about them? I mean, you know, we look look at verse 9 back in Ephesians 6. Verse 9, it says, And ye masters. Now there are four verses, 5, 6, 7, 8. Deal with the, the slave or the employer, the employee. Verse 9 deals with the employer or the master. It says, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. So it, it's like, you know, you got to remember, he's saying to the masters that you have a master. And he's in heaven. Uh, Christian masters are to do the same as their slaves. The slaves are to submit to their masters and the masters are to acknowledge the worth of the slaves through faith treatment or fair treatment of them. Okay? Okay? Now back in this day, see this is, you can treat them any way you want. 
You can kill them if you want. You can beat them if you want. You can throw them on the dung hill or dung heap if you want it. Don't make a difference. They're yours, your property. You can do with them what you want. Now, Paul is trying to reverse some of this stuff. And he's telling them, you know, save slave owners were called on to care for those who served them. They were called to a far higher standards than the world around them. The world around them says, this slave is your property, do with him or her as you please. Kill them, you can whip them, you can beat them, you can whatever. Paul's saying now, hey, you serve, you're safe. You are not the same creature, the same man or uh, woman that you were. So now you got to realize that you got to treat them differently. Even though that yeah they belong to you, when we look at this slave and master relationship, that they do belong to you, but you are called to care for them more than what the world says that you have to do. Paul described this kind of mutual submission when he wrote the book of Philemon. In that book, a slave owner by the name of Philemon has a slave by the name of Onesimus who ran away from his master and stole some of his master's goods. We don't, we don't, you know, he ran away with some of his master's stuff. We don't know what it was. It doesn't say Onesimus goes to Rome where he just happens to run into Paul. He hears the gospel and is saved by the grace of God. Now Paul sends Onesimus home with a letter. This letter, which is what we call the book of Philemon, calls on Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to welcome him home as a brother because of his uh, standing in Christ. It's an amazing request. I mean, you know, you're literally looking at a slave who is your property that stole or took something from you and then ran away. And now Paul is telling Philemon, hey, what you need to do is forgive Onesimus because he is now your brother in Christ Jesus. You have a new relationship with him. He is no longer, you are no longer just a master and he is no longer just your slave. He is your brother in Christ Jesus. Most slaves who stole from their masters and ran away were executed when they were captured. And if they weren't executed, they were tortured or castrated. They suffered for their sins. This is a call for Philemon now to make his Christianity real. You say you, you are a Christian? Let's put it to the test. He's not to treat slaves like Onesimus as just mere property. He is to treat them as people that God loves. Masters like Philemon were to realize that they have a master as well. Just as their servants served under them, they serve under the Lord. 
They expected their slaves to submit. God expected them to submit. So, you know, it works on both sides of this thing. And little be it known that if the Lord has blessed a person and that person is in a place of authority you know, of authority over others, they need to take this command to heart. It's far too easy for employers to take advantage of their employees. It's too easy for the employer to see the employee as nothing more than a means or a tool for them to increase their profits. Employers would do well to remember that they also have a master. And one day, they will answer to the Lord for how they treat their employees. Now, you know, there are circumstances in every case but if they're doing and they're giving you a good day's work for a good day's pay, then we ought to, it ought to be that that mutual uh, admiration or, or admonition basically. So while the master really can't know what it's like to be a slave, the master must respect his slaves. He is to honor their humanity and sympathize with their condition. It's simply a call for Christian masters to treat those under their authority in a Christ-like manner. Basically, it's nothing more than treat them as you would want to be treated. And that's what, you know, but in this day and time, I mean, that that is like a whole new mindset for the Christian slave relationship. It's not there that relationship was nothing more than you're my property, I own you, do this and you better do it or else. You know? And Paul's trying to reverse this stuff to get the masters to understand that, hey, you're their master, but you are also, if you are born again, you are also the slave, and you have a master. So you need to be thinking about your relationship and then act in this relationship here on this earth according like the servants the master is to do the will of God from the heart the employer like the employee must be motivated by a desire to obey God and to do His will. Their main job ought to, I mean, in all that they do, it is to please Him. Just as the employee is to submit to the employer as to the Lord. The employer is to exercise his authority as to the Lord. This is the only way that they can fulfill the command that's found in chapter 5 and verse 21 that says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So what does it boil down? It boils down a Christian employer's first duty is to do the will of God and to manifest a Christ-like spirit in everything he does. 
Every business decision must be based on God's standards of righteousness, truth, and honesty. He must deal with his employees with an eye to their welfare and to the best interest. He is to deal with them fairly because it is the will of God for him to do so. Now, you know, in this day, Paul's day, boy, that's a whole new way of looking at things. He is to deal with them fairly because it is the will of God for him to do so. He is to respect them because to respect his employees is to respect and honor the Lord. When you respect them, you are respecting Him. That's what He's trying to get them to understand. The Master is not to threaten them. That is, the Christian employer is not to use the threat of violence to coerce his employees into doing what he wants them to do. Just like that one uh, told Jesus, he said, look, I command these men. I tell them to go here or there and they go here or there. I tell them to do this or that and they do this or that. But we are, he didn't have to threaten them. You know, it was that mutual, we could say from what we hear, you know, it's that mutual respect of authority. We look and uh, you shouldn't have to try to bribe your employees to do the job they're getting paid to do anyway. I mean, what is that? When I used to work for the post office, there were, there were some that they would work harder not doing work than they would working. Trying to stay out of work than working. He is, the master is to exercise his power over them as little as possible. Now, they know that he has power over them when we look at the master-slave relationship. They know that he has, whether they live or die, whether they eat or what, it's all by his voice. But he shouldn't have to exercise that kind of authority over them. He must realize that his authority is only temporary and it's, only, and it's given to him by God. Thus, he is to not be abusive physically or verbally. He is not to throw his weight around. He is not to do all things with the sure knowledge that he has a master in heaven that he will also answer for one of these days. He is to treat his employees with the same love and care that the Lord displays to him. He needs to realize that in God's eyes, he is not more important than the least of his employees because there is no respect of persons with him. God doesn't care whether you're the master or the slave, whether you're the ditch digger or the white collar worker in an office. It doesn't matter to him. All that matters to him is how you react and you respect him. The Christian employer does not play favors because God doesn't play any favors. 
He is to be Christ-like in all that He does. All that He does, He is to be Christ-like. We look in this, this whole setup is a way in which to turn the mind around. We have to understand that this this mindset is something that's a total turnaround from what they're used to. But Paul tells them, hey look, but if you are born again as you claim you're born again, then your heart's got to be different. Your mindset's got to be different. The way that you do things got to be different. The way that you look at things has to be different. And he's trying to get them to understand these things. And this is first century church, you know. But still, when we look at it, it has a lot to say about even today that we can glean from if we just would. So anyway, uh, we'll pray in the month on Wednesday. So let's pray and we can uh, go our separate ways this evening. Lord, we do come thanking You. Lord, we thank You for this morning, Lord for the liberty that you gave us this morning. Lord, as we opened your your word and, and we preached your word, Lord. Lord, we pray that, that as we continue to study your word, Lord, that you would help us to discern, Lord, about your word. That we would see just what you are telling us. Lord, if it wasn't important for us, then you wouldn't have it to be included in your book. So we have to realize that all that's in this front cover to back is important for us as well. Lord, I pray now that as we go uh, our, our separate ways that, Lord, you keep us safe till we reach destination. Lord, that you would, uh, uh, as they call them for the rain, Lord, you know just what we need and, and things. And, Lord, we ask that you would, would send what uh, you would have us to get, Lord. And we'll thank you for it. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord. And, uh, all that we say and do, for it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.